Okay, uh, let's start. Uh, so we were discussing about uh, poles and zeros. And in the previous lecture, uh, we spent considerable amount of time in developing the intuition behind how to figure out uh, how many poles are there, how many zeros are there, right? And to figure out the zeros using using intuition. And uh, let's go back to our discussion on um, poles and zeros in common source amplifier and its corresponding frequency response. And again, let me emphasize that, I mean, there is a there is a biasing network, but I'm not showing it. Just, uh, we, we understand that there is a biasing network without that nothing is going to work. And this is only for small signal purposes. And at the output node, I am um, marking the capacitance as CL. L stands for load. Uh, with the with the with knowledge that uh, it it includes obviously the drain to body capacitance and obviously the capacitance of the succeeding stage. The succeeding stage can as well be the same guy, right? It can be the same same amplifier, or it can be something else. But uh, regardless, it will be. Uh, let's assume that this CL is some some load which the which your amplifier has to drive. Okay, so uh, and then we further saw that uh, this will obviously have two poles because we have uh, we can essentially decide on two sets of independent initial conditions on these capacitors. I, I mean either of these two capacitors. And we also saw that this will have one zero, right? So uh, the easy part was the zero frequency. What is the zero frequency? Pardon? GM over CGT. And how do we get that? We fix, we said V naught to be equal to zero and we solve for KCL, right? So if we said V naught to be equal to zero and solve for KCL, we get this. Uh, then we had two poles, and we if we assume that the poles were split, right? So if we assume that if P one is much much less than P two, right? Mod P one is much much less than mod P two. That is, we know that there are two poles, and let's assume that the poles are far apart, right? So then uh, we said that after doing all those maths. We said that one of the poles, let's say P1, would have, would have been at minus. Again, let me express this in terms of a current source and G so that it becomes easier to express. Now tell me what is the denominator? So I'm essentially saying that I uh, this system is coupled, right? By default, this system is coupled because uh, there is a CGD capacitance. I, I should not be able to break the system into sets of uncoupled bits. But however, uh, by making this assumption that P1 is much, much less than P2, we are essentially saying that I'll, I, we are probably trying to associate a time constant with each of these nodes, right? We're trying to associate a time constant with the node V1 and the node V0 with, again, the assumption that there is somehow we should be able to replace, represent each of these nodes V1 and V0 in this way, right? So, so this is again a big, very big assumption. This need not necessarily be the case. So you are trying to say that 
there will be some G equivalent and there will be some C equivalent associated with G1. And there will be some, let us equivalent one, G equivalent one. And there will be some C equivalent two and G equivalent two associated with V0. Right, so this is the this is the assumption that we are making, and if this is the case, then probably we can express our transfer function something like this, right? So this this would have this was the case with respect to uh, this, this this was the case with respect to uh, uh, um, when CGD was equal to zero when we neglected CGD. We could arrange that circuit in such a way that we had a. If, if CGT were not there, then the gate, then the uh, transfer, then, and then the transfer function could have been represented as product of two transfer functions, one associated with the input side, one associated with the output side. Right? We agree with that. Okay. So now, if we have CGT, ideally, we shouldn't be able to do this. Because now it's coupled, the input and the output are coupled through CGD. But things become second order. We get, it's difficult to get intuition. It's difficult to understand uh, how to change things, how to for, how to change uh, your uh, component values to move the poles in directions we want. So, uh, so we we are trying to find out if there is a way we can get more intuition and. To that, to do that, we need, we needed to develop a methodology in such a way that we can split our transfer function into first order just, uh, chunks of first order stuffs which we can multiply, right? So, so for that, if we have to get into first order stuff, which means that we are inherently implying it's a first order RC. There is no L, so there's only first order RC, which means uh, in terms of circuit parallelance, we should be able to break the circuit into chunks of independent uncoupled first order sections right so that's the entire thought process again the thought process is such is like this because we it's easy to it's easy to analyze first order systems right so let's say if this is the actual transfer function not an approximate transfer function what is the pole associated with v1 and what is the pole associated with v0 Right, so G equivalent one by C equivalent one and C G equivalent two by C equivalent two. Now, if I want to, let's say, uh, decide to move the pole associated with G equivalent one to a much lower frequency, then what should I do? Right, so I, then it's easy to see. I either reduce G equivalent one or I increase C equivalent one, right? Similarly, we can take equivalent actions with respect to the pole associated with the other node, right? So it's associated with V naught. So you see that these you, you can get easy intuitions by if you can break things into small sections of first orders. Similar thing cannot be said if it had been a second order system, right? Then you do we don't know. Uh, it's not very apparent by looking at a second order transfer function. What should I change in the circuit in order to figure it out? Okay, so that is the motivation behind doing all these things. If we were good at finding out the intuition with a second order system, we wouldn't have done these things, right? So it's not only a fallacy of we, as in we are who are gathered in this class. It's a problem with humanity because we are not particularly good at having multiple variables in mind, right? So if you are good at it, then you don't have to do all these things. You can look at the second order transfer function and get an intuition. Okay, so uh, so fine. So now, if this were the case, P one would have been uh, G equivalent by C equivalent, where G equivalent would have been is what G S, right? And C equivalent would have is C G S plus one that Miller effect one plus G M R L times C G D. Plus some additional term which we neglected, right? Because we hypothesized that that, that those will be uh, those will not be uh, relevant. Okay, and what was so? Let me delete this stuff for the time being.
And what was P2? So let me uh, sketch the stuff with respect to P2 once. So looking at the output node, right? So what am I seeing? So if I have to find out the time constant, or if I have to find out, if we are trying to make anything look like a first order RC, which means with respect to any node, the Thevenin equivalent should be one R and one C, right? So we are trying to Thevenize our circuit looking at this node, right? Essentially, that's what we are trying to do. And what are we seeing? We are seeing that there is a capacitance CL, there is this guy, CGD. There is this guy, CGS. And also there is an RS and there is an R. Right? And uh, after we did all those, uh, all those maths to try to figure out what will be the pole associated with this, uh, with the overall contraption, we found an expression. And the expression was of of this order, right? It was it was similar to uh, correct me if I am wrong. Uh, so it was GL plus GM times CGD by CGD plus CGS plus something which we neglected, and in the denominator we had CL plus CGD CGS by CGD plus CGS. Right, this was the form that we had got. Now we are trying to make sense of why this was, this made any sense, right? It's still in the form of some conductance by, by some capacitance, but we wanted, wanted to figure out why this made any sense because it's not apparent why we have these terms here. And we had a brief discussion about this. And what we saw was, let's say if we neglect this RS, Right. If we neglect this RS, then we had some hope of understanding what this circuit actually is. And what was the what was the hypothesis? The hypothesis was anyway, this RL is to ground. So I can put this RL here. Right. So if we are trying to thevenize this circuit looking from here, so the most apparent things that are can be ticked off is in the conductance term, I should have a GL. So this GL appears. In the capacitance terms, I should have a CL. So this CL appears. But I, I am also having a couple of extra terms, which seem to be non-negligible because anything that is multiplied to GM, right? So you cannot really neglect that because GM is the dominant term. The core of your transistor is the GM and that by design, we are trying to make it large, right? So, so then we'll have to uh, stop, pause a while and then figure out what the hell is this term, right? Why this GM times CGD by CGD plus CGS is important and why, what is the genesis of that? And we also started discussing why this was important. So if I forget about the GL and CL for the time being, because they are very obvious. So then the question boils down to what is that, what is the equivalent, what is the Thevenin equivalent of this circuit, right? So can I represent this circuit as something like some uh, C equivalent to or let me just say C equivalent and R equivalent, right? So if we can represent this circuit as an RC, equivalent RC, then probably we can justify why those extra terms appear as they do. So what is the justification? So if I have to figure out what is the seven equivalent of this, what should I do? I, I can put a test voltage. and find out the test current, right? So 
So what if I put a test voltage, what is the gate voltage that appears? You did this right in the quiz. So what is the gate voltage that appears? CGD by And note that this is independent of S, right? This is the real term, no S. Then what is this current? GM times of that, GM times of CGD. Right? So this is the current through the transistor. It's a real current, no imaginary part. What is the current through the capacitance? What is this current? No, right? Why? Right, so it's two capacitors in series, right? So it will be P test times S times CGD, CGS, YCGD plus CGS. Right? So what is I test then? The sum of these two currents. Correct? So this is I test. Right? So what is I test over V test? Is SCGD, CGS, Right? So this is what? This is admittance or impedance? This is admittance. So this is some Y equivalent. Right? So two impedances are, uh, two admittances are adding up, which means they are in series or parallel. They are in parallel. Okay, fine. So they are in parallel and out of which one term is completely real and other term is S times something. Right? So this is S times something, and other term is completely real. What is the real term? It's an equivalent. Right? Equivalent of what? Right? Yeah, it's equivalent to an admittance. Right? So this is equivalent to this guy is equivalent to one over R equivalent. And what is the other term? S times something. It should be a capacitance, right? S times something in term, in admittance domain is a capacitance, right? So this is equivalent to some C equivalent. So your C equivalent here. So, so this guy becomes this guy, and this guy becomes this guy. Okay. So we are essentially trying to justify why we have those extra terms in P2. Right. So now if I zoom out and try to see whether it makes sense, right? So this structure can be represented with replaced with this structure. Right. So in essence, what we are getting is the time constant, I mean the pole associated with the node V2, V naught, if we were able to split. Uh, the uh, split, split our transistor transfer function into sets of first order uh, uncoupled terms would have been this equivalent or equivalent then we had this CL and we had this R or let me represent this in terms of G equivalent and GL And this would have been V naught, right? So what is the, and when I'm putting V naught, obviously the assumption is that there are stops associated with that, otherwise V naught is always zero. Uh, so P2 is minus something by something where the conductance term is GL plus G equivalent and the, um, and the capacitance term is CL plus some C equivalent, right? So out of which we see that the C equivalent term is 
series combination of CGD CGS. And the GP valent term is GM times some, some, fra some fraction. And what is the genesis of that fraction? The genesis of the fraction is, again, let me sketch it because this is, this is extremely vital. The genesis of the equivalent extra term in the, in the conductance domain is the fact that if we excite the drain voltage with a test voltage, right? If we, if we excite this drain voltage with the test voltage, some fraction of this drain voltage, some fraction of this drain voltage appears at the gate. The capacitor divider, right? Some fraction of that gate drain voltage appears at the gate through this capacitor divider, which, which in turn excites a current through the transistor. Right? If CGD were not there, right? If CGD were not there, this action would have been absent. Right? If CGD were zero, then the gate wouldn't have been excited at all. Right? So this extra term doesn't appear if the feedback around the cap around the transistor were absent, right? So that this extra equivalent term in the output pole is present because there is a feedback around the transistor, right? In other word, other way of saying the same thing is that the coupled nature of this transistor is creating an extra pole or is moving the location of the pole with respect to an alcoupled uncoupled system. Had CGD not been there, so if CGD had not been there, then the whole, then the equivalent transfer function would have been with respect to V0, you have something, right? You have stops connected here. Forget about the stops connected here. Uh, this is CL, this is GL. In the absence of CGD, what would have been the pole location? minus GL over CL. Because here you have an input, you, in order to find out the time constants, you short the input. So if you short the input, obviously the gate gets shorted because nothing is coming in, the gate gets shorted, which means this transistor is irrelevant, right? If the transistor is irrelevant, the equivalent R and C at the output node is GL and CL. So minus GL over CL would, would have been the location of the pole. However, if you now have a capacitance between the gate and the drain, then a very important thing happens is that if you have to find out the time constant at the output node, then you cannot neglect the feedback around the transistor. Because the moment you consider feedback around the transistor, which essentially means that you are activating the transistor PGS. Moment to activate the transistor's DGS, you cannot neglect the current through the transistor, right? Because the transistor is the uh, is the centerpiece of your design, right? So if you ultimately you would want a lot of transconductance because that's what an amplifier is in our case. So which means that any excitation at the between the gate and the source cannot be neglected, and because of that we are getting an extra. It, it looks like we are able to increase the output impact admittance, right? So let me rephrase the last statement. In the absence of CGD, what is the output admittance? GL. In the presence of CGD, do you think the output admittance remains the same or it has increased? It has increased. And if CGD is not negligible, right? Which means that CGD over CGS, that fraction is not negligible, then this extra admittance that appears because of feedback around the capacitance is can, is likely to be is dominant over GL, right? At least of the same order. I mean, we haven't really uh, considered what is the typical values of GL, but at least you can we can say that it, it cannot be neglected, which means that we have been able to increase the output conductance. Right, and so much so that in some cases the output conductance, I mean the equivalent output conductance, can be dominated by this 
Let's take a feedback term. This GM times CGD by CGD plus GCGS term, right? However, the same is not particularly true for the uh, for the capacitance term because this capacitance, even though this is obvious that this is a series combination of CGD and CGS, right? If generally when you are designing an amplifier, you are using it to drive some load, which means that CL can be dominant, right? Ultimately, you are designing it. I mean, ultimately, you are designing a transistor to drive certain capacitive and certain resistive load. Otherwise, there's no point in making a transistor, uh, making an amplifier, right? If the load would have been absent, I could have, could have as well probably given the input directly to the output, right? That's a case to be made, right? I mean, if I don't want amplification, if I just want to transfer the input to the output without the effect of any loading, then I can simply connect the input to the output, right? So uh, granted, you won't get any amplification in that case. However, in this case, in this case, if we have to uh, eventually drive some capacitance or some uh, some resistance, then you cannot directly connect the input to the output because there will be loading effect, which means you have to put something in between. And we let's say that we have put this amplifier in between, which means that uh, by the very nature in, by, uh, through which I'm framing the question, I'm assuming that our amplifier has to drive a significant capacitive load or a significant resistive load, or maybe a bit of both. Which essentially means that CL probably can be can be large. Okay, so again, it's case to case basis. If CL is not large, then if you know if CL is large, then the denominator will be dominated by CL. If CL is not large, it can as well be is dominated by the other term, right? The series uh, combination of CGD and CGS. But in general, in most ICs, in most uh, amplifiers in an IC. You end up, we end up designing amplifiers which drive capacitive loads. And some of them have to drive a resistive load because again, this is this is not a genetic statement. This is uh, a statement based on how the IC design industry works. Uh, you are when you are making an making an making an amplifier. The ampl if the amplifier is directly driving an external environment, right? right which essentially means that. Uh, you have a chip. Let's say you have a chip, and in the chip you have certain pads. Associated with it, and you have multiple amplifiers inside some driving each other and some driving the pads. Right? So generally, if you assume all of these are common source amplifiers, right? Just for the sake of argument, let's assume all of them are common source amplifier. So if let's say one common source amplifier drives another common source amplifier, what is the type of impedance that it sees? Do you see a capacitive impedance or do you see a resistive impedance? It's a capacitive impedance, right? There can be a resistive impedance because you can have this resistor divider to bias the input and all, right? But however, the way we design an amplifier at the input side, we design in such a way that the resistive loading is negligible. Right, we can increase those R1, R2 to 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 make it make them relevant. But you cannot make the capacitive load irrelevant. So, which means that internally, if a common source amplifier drives another common source amplifier, because this is the only amplifier we know as of now, you can hypothesize that the input impedance of the following stage is capacitive, mostly. However, I mean, again, this is yeah, you. This is something we haven't discussed. Uh, not particularly relevant right now, but you should. It, it's it's good to remember. If you drive something in the external world, right? If you're driving something which is outside the chip, almost invariably you have to assume that there is a resistive network associated with it. So if you are making an making making an amplifier which drives something outside the chip, there will be a significant GL. If you are driving something inside the chip, it will be dominated by capacitance. Why am I saying all these things? Because depending upon what you are, what your amplifier is. This location of the pole can change, right? So, as a designer, you should keep in mind: Are you driving a resistive load, which is significant, or are you driving a capacitive load, which is significant? Because based on that, this pole location can move. Okay. So, this is not like 
because we are we are neglecting certain terms, it will be neglected all the time. So it can be neglected all the time. Okay. Okay. Any questions till now? Okay. So, so now that we have uh, now that we have a, a rudimentary understanding of where the poles are, let's sketch the Bode plot. So when you are sketching the Bode plot, we obviously are assuming that the input has been applied and we are taking the output. Right? It's not no longer in that domain where the input is irrelevant. So let's do the uh, magnitude part first, and then we'll do the phase part. Okay. So what is the uh, what is the DC gain? This is where you tell me an answer. What is the DC gain? GM model, right? Is GM or GM over GL? Okay. So then I'll be hitting a pole P1. What is the pole location? CS upon CGS plus one plus GMRL times CGD, right? So after that, what is going to happen? It's going to roll off at 20 dB per decade, correct? Okay, so then we have a decision to make uh, whether the second pole come first or the zero comes first, right? So let me write out the pole and the zero locations in a concise manner, so that will probably help. This is P1, this is P2, and this is zero. So, so if I sketch mod of P1, mod of P2, or if I write it down, so this is, and if I make it really simplistic, and if we assume that this term dominates, right, in the in the in the denominator, so then I can say this P1 is GS by GMRL times CGD. P2, if I again assume that this is that the feedback term dominates, then this is. GM times CGD by CGD by CGS by CL, right? This is assuming capacitive loading, right? A lot of assumptions. You should keep those assumptions in mind. Uh, Z is GM by CGD. So this seems to be the simplest. However, note that this is a right-hand side zero, right? Because P1 and P2 had negative signs. C has a positive sign. It's a right-hand side zero. Okay, so so if I first compare the locations of uh, between P1 and P2, we, the starting assumption was P1 is much less than P2, right? So again, the, the assumption has to be tested. And how should I test the assumption? That assumption you should test by seeing whether actually the first term is smaller than the second term. Right, and one can argue that there is no way we can test this because we don't know what GS is, we don't know what GM is, right? So, so that that argument is correct. However, if it were not the case, right? For example, I am assuming that P1, if we are assuming P1 is much less than P2, and under what condition do you think this this assumption can fail? Right, if either GS is very high or GM is very low, right? So that is one, one condition in which the assumption can fail. Another another uh, scenario where this assumption can fail is if CL is very low, then I have that extra term that will dominate, right? So all of these things can happen where this assumption can fail. So as a designer, you should keep these things in mind. These are, I mean, these simplistics are based on multiple assumptions, okay? But let's assume those assumptions are true, right? We can always break the model by choosing values which are not uh, consistent with the assumptions. But let's assume these assumptions are the whole good, which means that P1 is much less than P2. And let's consider what is the location of, uh, what is the relative location between P2 and Z, right? So do you think Z is at a higher frequency than P2 or P2 is at a higher frequency than Z? Why? 
Right, exactly, right. So, so the numerator term definitely, if we compare in Z, the numerator terms or the conductance is higher, right? And the denominator term in Z is lower with respect to the denominator of P2, right? So, naturally, it is expected that by the arguments that we have made, Z will be at a higher frequency than P2, right? So, which means that when we are sketching the Bode plot, the as we go from P1 to higher frequency, the first thing that we will hit will be P2, and after that we will hit Z. Right? Does that make sense? Okay, fine. So, we will we'll hit P2, and then we will hit, so we will say, once we hit, hit P2, what happens to the roll up? Yeah, right. Another additional minus 20 dB. So it goes something like this. And then we hit Z. So maybe I should make it a bit slope here. Okay. Then we hit Z. And then what happens? It restores back to minus 20 dB per decade. Right? Okay. So now let's say we uh, we saw this. This, uh, this is what that is happening. And for some reason, we would want to, we don't want P1 and P2 to be close together. Maybe the assumptions we wanted for some reason. We'll see later on in the course why we want those assumptions. But let's say for some reason, we don't want P1 and P2 to be close together. After doing all the calculations and I put the circuit in a simulator and I find out the locations on P1 and P2. And you see that they are not particularly far apart. Let's say I want them to be, 100x apart, they are 10x apart, right? I would, for some reason, I want P1 and P2 to be 100x apart from each other, but I see that they are only 10x apart, right? And so I want to put, pull them out and make them 100x apart. So as a designer, what should I do? And I don't want to affect the DC gain because the gain is the core of the amplification uh, part, right? I don't want to compromise on DC gain. I want to keep DC gain as it is, but I have to split the poles apart. So what are the things that I, I can possibly do? You cannot tamper with GL, CL, GS because they are not in your control. Typically GL, CL are something that you are driving and GS is something is a previous stage that is driving your stage, right? Things that are, in your con are not in your control, you cannot touch. We'll get to WIL. What are the things that, I mean, in terms of small single parameters, what do you think you should do? So let's take step by step, right? So we, if we want to split the poles, right? If we want to split the poles, we can, we, what we are essentially saying, we can do either of the three things. We can either push P2 to higher frequency while not touching P1, or we can push P1 at a lower frequency without touching P2 or we can split both of them apart, right? These are the three possible combinations. Is there any other possible combination? No, right? So that's the basic thing, right? We have to split them apart. So now if we know we have to split them apart and these are the three possible combinations, given uh, and assuming that the assumptions that we have laid out till now is correct. So what is the, what are the possible things that I can do? I want to split. GS not in your control. We can increase CGD, yes. Okay. If we increase CGD, what's going to happen? P1 will shift to the P1 will shift to the left, right? Yes. Uh, P1 will shift to the left and P2 will shift to the right. That seems to be the best condition, right? If I increase CGD, then P1 goes to the left and P2 goes to the right. Great. Right? But do you think there is a limit to that? Or, I mean, this formula, I mean, this set of number, I mean, uh, dependencies is telling me that I can keep playing this game. By the way, how do I increase CGD? Yeah, but if I tamper W and L, then many things can change, right? So let's say I, in order to increase CGD, I increase W, right? So what's likely to happen? GM will increase, decrease. It will increase, right? So, so, so let's say I, 
now i am drawing the full vdd with 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 poison okay so i increase w or increase w by l so by increasing w so what will happen to the quiescent current it will increase right the quiescent current id will increase if quiescent current increases by because i have increased w do you see a potential problem the device might go out yeah the device might go out of saturation because if we are operating through a finite supply we have to ensure that v not is at least the difference between v not and vgs vg is not more than one threshold voltage v not cannot go down too much if i increase id because i have increased w granted probably you are trying to increase gm but what is likely to be your problem your transistor might go out of saturation it might go into linear if it goes into linear all these things the amplifier that you are desiring goes out of the window a dc gain will go drop the reason i am harping on this is because the this first simulation assignment that you guys will do you have to deal with these things okay so uh, so essentially you cannot really arbitrarily increase w even though this set of expressions are telling you that in order to increase gm or you have to increase cgd increasing w will be a relevant choice right so if we cannot increase cgd by increasing w what is the other way of increasing that if you, so cgd is what is the capacitance between gate and drain and does it matter how that capacitance came into being or i can add any extra capacitance and nothing will else will change we can add capacitance right so if we have to increase cgd we can actually add some extra capacitance or let me say set like some c additional yes isn't cgd property of mosfet yes so you cannot uh, what we are saying essentially but nothing is nothing is stopping you know, stopping you from adding an extra capa explicit capacitance right so capacitance is available you can add an explicit capacitor uh, across cgd uh, across the uh, in parallel to the gate and the drain okay so that seems to be doing doing the trick it is pushing p1 to the lower frequency and p2 to higher frequency but now let's say i get greedy and i keep doing it i i increase cgd i increase the c extra c additional so what do you think can be a problem or, or rather even if, before i say whether it will be a problem or not can you comment on uh, whether uh, any of these expressions that we are right now looking at might get affected p2 will become g upon cgs why do you think say so yeah so p2 will essentially become constant right that's a good observation right so p2 will become essentially you will not be able to move p2 to the right too much because what will effectively happen is this term will be become one cgd will dominate so it will saturate at gm over cl right so one might argue that there is the thing that we neglected we had cgd cgs by cgd plus cgs so there was an additional term that we neglected if cgd starts to dominate this term will also become cgs right it's a parallel a series i mean series combination of two capacitors the minimum capacitance dominates right so see if cgd tends to infinity for example the additional term becomes cgs so denominator becomes cl plus cgs and the numerator becomes gm and that's where p2 saturates okay but even more importantly what is happening to z the z keeps on decreasing to lower frequency right it will keep on increasing cgd right so we haven't yet uh, we haven't yet dealt into this that if there a, is there a problematic scenario if c becomes a lower or is a good thing or a bad thing uh, we will deal with this later in the course but for for now just 
take it as a face value that right hand right hand side zero is is hardly ever a good thing right so if if you find somewhere that right that we have a right hand side zero uh, it's all almost always a disaster waiting to happen so it's better to not have right hand side zero if possible okay so again we'll see why i made the statement later on in the course for now let's have it at a face value right so uh, so uh, so essentially what i'm what i'm trying to point out is that one single variable can affect multiple of multiple factors in your circuit so and also it's not necessary that if some if you are increasing something something good is happening which means you even double down and increase it further good things will keep on happening right so so that's essentially the principle anyhow i mean in almost everything in life right it's not as if uh, something that is good for you you overdo it will be good for you if you even if you overdo it too much right so that similar uh, situation is happening here okay okay mm. so so let what else can we do what is there anything else that we can do let's say i mean we have saturated on cgd is there anything else that we can do to split the poles reduce gm okay let's see if reducing gm will it help reducing gm what will that do to p1 gl gl and cl not in your control right they are loads that you are driving you are designing an amplifier those for those gl and cl you cannot change them the only thing that you can change is your amplifier this 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 core stuff right only thing that you can change is this okay decrease cgs fine so how do you decrease cgs okay so you add an extra capacitance with cd so let's do that so so we have cgs here so where do you want to add here i presume right where Okay, I mean, even if you would, I presume. So, what do you, where? I mean, I mean, let, let's have a discussion about this in the class, right? So, the 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 suggestion was to add an extra capacitance in series because adding a capacitance in series reduces the capacitance, right? So, yes, it indeed does. So, in this case, where should we add the capacitance? Ideally, where should we add this capacitance? So in series with CGS means what? I can add it. Do you do you mean I can add it here? Okay. Yes. In fact, if we can do this, this should be good. But can we do this? Right. We cannot do this. Why? Because CGS is not an explicit capacitance. It comes with the device. Right. Okay. So this cannot be done. Which specifications are you looking for? They have already done the calculation before and then they right. say that they want to be right yeah so his question what you are essentially saying is uh, we will basically tell uh, our vendor or a customer that this is the best we can do we cannot do any better right now think of you, you as a customer right <laughs> would you be satisfied <laughs> Right, so it's it, now situation has flipped. Right, you will have to satisfy the customer. Right, so you'll have to decide. You have to make the best choices so that your customer is ultimately have to sell the product. It's always we can always say that we cannot do anything. Yeah, I mean go to somewhere else. Right, but and then we don't have a job. So, some I mean uh, there are fundamental limits. Obviously, yes. Mm -hmm. You can increase capacitance by putting an extra capacitance, but can you decrease capacitance? If we, let's say, had a negative capacitance somehow, if we had a negative capacitance, then we probably could have applied something here, minus C and reduce. But with negative capacitance, in most cases, is not a 
feasible solution, right? So it's probably, I mean, we, we stay away from negative capacitances because they also are not fairly obvious, not easily available, have other issues. So given that we don't have negative capacitance, you cannot put capacitances in parallel and decrease capacitances. And looks like we cannot even put capacitance in series because it's not, the ports are not available. Right? It comes with the transistor. So putting a series capacitance is out of question. So, so now what, what else? CL you cannot touch. <clears throat> Some suggestion came from here, yes. To some extent, it's correct, but uh, there is a caveat there, right? So what you said, in essence, is correct. If RL, so typically the way we connect RL is this, right? Generally, the way we connect RL is this, correct? And this is generally a biasing resistor RD. Right. So why is this particular structure relevant? It's relevant because as a custom, I mean, we cannot change anything on RL. Yes, we can, but we can change RD. RD is a design variable, right? We cannot change RL. If RL were connected directly from the drain to the, uh, to the, uh, to, to VDD, then we didn't have any hope. However, it's possible to decouple the DC part of the circuit with respect to the AC transfer function of the circuit by putting a really large capacitance in between uh, RL and the, and the drain, right? And as you rightly suggested, now it seems like we can probably play out play with RD, correct? So, so let me ask you, why do you, did you say that reduce RD increases GM? <laughs> Yeah, it, yeah. Get compensated, right? Great, right? So what he is essentially suggesting is, see, I mean, the, the, the suggestion that came earlier was, let's increase GM, right? And well, only way to increase GM seemed like increasing current, right? You increase W or you increase current, it's equivalent thing that you increase current. If you increase current, the problem is our transistors can likely go out of saturation. But his suggestion, which is indeed a very good suggestion, is I increase current and I reduce RD, right? So this suggestion is only useful if we have this second configuration, if we have this configuration. If this configuration were there, that wouldn't have been useful because RL wouldn't have been in our control. But in the bottom configuration, right? We can essentially decouple these two, two scenarios and we can reduce RD and increase the current in order to keep the same same amount of quiescent and V naught, which means the transistor stays in saturation. However, we have to ensure that GM times RD, which is the kind of the gain, right? Or GM times RD parallel RL, which is the gain, doesn't change too much. I mean, ideally they should not change at all, right? So, but that is doable. We can do that, right? But right now you see from this argument, you can readily appreciate there is a very important trade-off. It seems like one of the ways of splitting the poles is, is dependent on burning more power. Right? You are burning more power to split the poles apart. And this we will see is almost always the theme in any analog circuit design. If you have to, after you hit a limit, one of the almost uh, an ubiquitous way of fire, making a design improvement is to burn more power. And this is just an example of, uh, of a case where it ends up being so, right? So another way of, I mean, another, an, uh, another suggestion that, uh, that uh, ca can come into being is, uh, is it possible to, let's say, uh, reduce GM, right? Uh, or rather, is it possible to reduce CGS and get something? It indeed is, but the problem is, we, as we suggested, that reducing CGS is not particularly apparent, right? So, however, if I say that I want to keep GM same and I want to reduce CGS, 
what is what is it that we are what what, what is it that i am trying to imply i want to keep gm same but i want to reduce cgs what am i implying exactly right uh, i want to if i keep the ratio of w and l same which means my gm is unaffected right given that vds is also constant right so if i keep the ratio of w by l same gm is as unaffected but i reduce both w and l by the same proportion what happens to cgs it decreases right so that is something that that seems like a doable solution right so minimum w i mean minimum w minimum l but the ratio is whatever it is and so so that you get you get same gm but lower cgs but the issue is in a technology node you cannot go beyond some minimum right which naturally gives gives you another indicator why people want to go to lower technology nodes right it's good it's helpful for speed it help it's helpful for pushing the poles apart or pushing the poles at higher frequency and so on right okay any questions okay uh, so let's assume that we have uh, we have done all these things that we have been talking about So uh, essentially what we are saying is our transfer function is something like this. So again, I mean, I'm repeating myself, but P1 and P2 are positive quantities because that's how we tend to write. If you're not comfortable, you can write mod P1, mod P2, right? Just to ensure that there is no sign mistake signage mistake but in case of zero you'll have to write it in a proper way because zero can be either left or right okay okay fine uh, so now let's say that i want to figure out till what frequency that amplifier actually amplifies which means i need to figure out till what frequency the amplifier gives you gain of more than zero dB. Or rather, you know, I, to, I want to find out the unity gain frequency of the amplifier, right? Of this configuration, right? So, so how should I approach it? The unity gain frequency can be in this piecewise linear segments that we have drawn. The unity gain frequency could have been in the could have been here. The unity gain frequency can be here, or the unity gain frequency can be here, depending upon how we choose the values, right? That just because I drew a x axis doesn't mean that doesn't mean anything. The unity gain frequency can be any, anywhere. Okay. So, so given that you have this transfer function, something like this, how will you approach? How will you go ahead and figure out in which line segment the unity gain frequency actually resides? Yes, you have to physically find out the values, true, but if you have to analyze it from first principles, what are you do? You have to assume something, right? How do you assume something? Uh, how do you go about analyzing anything which has a piecewise linear characteristics? You assume that the solution 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 exists in any of those segments. You go back and find out the solution, and then come back and see whether the solution actually matches the initial assumption. Right? It's almost always that is the most common way of dealing with any nonlinear stuff, right? You uh, assume that solution exists. In a range, you apply your first principles, try to figure out the solution is it correct or not by checking with the initial assumption. If, they, if it matches, fine. If it's not, go to the next segment. Right? So that same thing we'll do here. Right? So let's assume the solution exists uh, uh, here. Let's assume the solu solution exists somewhere in this segment. So so what should we do if the solution exists in that uh, segment? So what what is h of s? Let's assume the solution exists here. So what will be h of s? Uh, 
in terms of Z, P1, P2, A0. Right, so A0, A0 remains as is, and in the numerator, S is much less than Z, because that's the assumption. We are assuming that the pole resides in that segment. Uh, in this case, S will dominate over P1, because we are at higher frequency than P1. And in this case, S is much lower than P2, because we are at much lower frequency than P2. So H of S becomes A0 times P1 over S. Right, so so we can quickly plug in the values. A naught is GMRL, right? P one is approximately whatever we have been doing. What is P one? GS upon GMRL times CGD, right? And by S. So this goes. So GM, GS by, so GM also goes up, right? GM also goes up. So essentially this becomes GS by SCGD, right? So if your unity gain frequency is in that segment, then where is, what is the location? It will be GS over CGD, right? So if, the unity gain frequency lies in that segment, this point will be GS over CG, right? And now let's say for some reason, I want to move this unity gain frequency at a higher frequency because ultimately the goal of an amplifier is to amplify. And if we are looking for a high frequency amplifier, we have to ensure that the amplification happens still as high a frequency as possible. And I want to ensure, uh, if I have to do that, I have to, then push this unity gain bandwidth to a higher frequency, right? Because I mean, uh, if, if you let's say want a, a 100 megahertz amplifier, an amplifier which am amplifies at least till 100 megahertz, which means it's assumed that till 100 megahertz you have gain of more than one. Otherwise, there's no point of designing an amplifier, right? And let's say you design, you put things together, and you figured out that it's working till 50 megahertz which means that you have to iterate and you have to ensure that the bandwidth goes to higher frequency, right? So which essentially means that you have to do something and you figured out that doing all these things, the unity and frequency is in that first line segment and we don't want to change the pole locations, I mean, higher pole locations too much for some other reason. So what is the, what is the thing that I can do to push this, Unity gain frequency to higher frequency, only two things, right? C G S and C G D. G S typically not in your control. You have to reduce C G D, right? So all the things that we said right now, right? Seems like C G increasing C G D is going to help. You can see that has an impact, right? It has an impact on not letting your transistor amplifier to work at higher frequencies, right? So you cannot. Simply say that I know that pole splitting and all those things which are good or bad, we'll see later, can be, is doable by doing, by increasing CGD, but you are naturally trading off something. You are trading off a high frequency behavior. Okay. Okay. So Typically, no. The way we have, uh, way I have sketched, yes, but generally GS comes with the source. Because generally what is GS? If one transistor drives another, the load of the first transistor is the GS of the second transistor. But we can add explicit Yeah, yeah, you can add explicit capacitance, but will it will it uh, will it block GS? So let's say you have one common source amplifier, and you have another one. So generally, so this has you biased it somehow, right? So. So you are putting some capacitance here, right? So let's assume this R1, R2 is very high, like it's not loading. So for, uh, for all practical purposes, other than biasing, I can neglect that. So what do you think is the GS for the second transistor?
it's one upon RD1, right? So what is it? What what if I have to represent this guy as equivalent to this, or let's say equivalent to some current source GS. So what is GS if these two networks are equivalent? This is one by RD1. Basically, what we are looking for is the Thevenin impedance looking that side. Right? Thevenin impedance looking that side is RD1 parallel the G, I mean RDS of that first transistor. And let's assume RDS of the first transistor is much higher. So it's effectively one over RD1. So if you are not designing this, this is being given to you, which means you cannot control GS. That's all I'm saying. Okay. If you are designing both, then yes, you can. Then to some extent you can control. Okay. Okay, fine. Uh, any questions regarding anything till now? Okay. Yes. Then yeah, then to some extent you can control, right? If you are designing the entire chain, then to some extent you, know, you can control, right? So then you can obviously say that, okay, so let's, you want to reduce GS, right? Or what if you say you wanted to increase GS? You want to increase GS, fine. So you increase GS means you want to you want to reduce RD, RD1. Someone dealing with the first state, right. so uh, by connecting, we can add some components. Okay, okay, let's do that. So your uh, his suggestion is uh, the first stage has been given to you, you cannot change. You are designing second stage. And here you want to put something, right? What do you want to put? Okay, so let's put parallel resistance. Uh, I'm assuming we have capacitance and all those things in between, right? So, so let's put that also. Blocking capacitance and all, right? So that it doesn't load and all. So do you see any issue with this? Do you see by putting, uh, let's say, some R extra? Do you see any 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 ex any problem with this or this is fine? It will definitely reduce increase GS undoubtedly because now this R extra is coming in parallel with RD. It's effectively lowering the output impedance, so GS increase definitely. But do you see an issue? Gain reduces, right? You don't want to do anything that jeopardizes the gain because that's the whole point, right? You want gain, right? So you are seeing the trade-offs, right? These are the trade-offs, right? So when you design, you have to handle this, okay? Okay, any any other suggestions? Can we put any algorithm like an yeah. Can you repeat? Any algorithm like an algorithm that cannot... That's the whole point, right? Suggest isolation mechanisms. I mean, we can do many things, but with that, uh, with, with, with the knowledge that we have till now in the course, what else can you do? We'll see later on what else can be done, but right now, what else can you do? Right? This is like building this big Legos, right? If you have play, played with puzzles, you want to insert some block somewhere else, but you know, if you want to insert that, some structure will play it somewhere. Right? So it's equivalent to that, right? So it's playing with, uh, playing with constraints. Okay, fine. Uh, so let's let's move ahead, right? So let's move ahead, and let's say that uh, uh, we, uh, I mean, we can do the same thing uh, if we say that. I mean, I am now changing slight, uh, changing direction, and we are not consider, uh, not talking about what, what, what do we need to do if we want to shift this unity gain bandwidth. So let's say the unity gain bandwidth is here within the second se segment. So what, what will be my, uh, what will be my approach? So we have to find out the transfer function corresponding to the second segment, right? So what will be the transfer function? So A naught by, what about this term? Yeah, right, so this term I cannot neglect, right? Because I'm operating at a frequency higher than P1. So this becomes S by P1, this becomes S by P2, which means A naught P1, P2, by S squared. 
and then you set this to one and then you figure out whatever it is and the value you get you get right so that you can do it yourself i will not do it for you right now okay so the last thing that i before we uh, stop today's class is let's say uh, let's say our transfer function for uh, it is this the Bode plot of this seems like this. I have P1, I have P2. And, and again, let's assume the P1 and P2 are split and we found that this is GS by GMRL CGD. P2 is some uh, CGD by and you have Z and so on. So while during analysis, right? During analysis, you figured that these P1 and P2 are not far enough, right? What is far enough, we haven't really uh, explored, but let's say instead of being like 10 times apart, they are only maybe 1.5 times apart, which essentially means that uh, after doing your math, you figured that uh, P1 and P2 are likely to be here. Right, so you put your numbers and you see P1 and P2 are likely to be here. Do you think anything in this model will break? Because we build this model with an assumption that P1 and P2 are far apart. So do you think anything in this model is going to break? That assumption is not, no longer true, right? So what is going to break? Ah, right, so that's, which means that why was this getting separated? Why, why, why were we seeing this splitting of poles? CGD was the sole factor, right? Because if CGD were not there, if CGD were not there, If CGD were not there, P1 would have been what? GS by CGS, right? P1 would have been and P2 would have been GL by CL, right? So after you did, let's say you did your, I mean, initially you, when you were designing, you figured out that this is what is supposed to happen because I told this in class and you put everything in simulator and you found that P1 and P2 are really close by. So what is the conclusion? Probably CGD is not high enough to split the poles because this pole splitting is happening because of CGD. Right? So again, initial assumptions are extremely necessary to move ahead with your design, with your analysis. But you have to keep on checking at every stage whether those assumptions are right or not. If they are wrong, then you have to go back and revisit. And then you take corrective actions, right? If at all necessary. Okay. Okay, fine. Let's stop here.